So again, welcome everybody. Um, can on those of you on Zoom, can you hear me all right? If there's any problem, please uh, let me know or type something in. Okay. Um, okay. So as um, Heather had mentioned, uh, I've been out of the country for quite some time now. I've been living in India, uh, studying at Sarah Monastery, uh, which as I often tell people is not what I envisioned actually when I thought about becoming a Buddhist monk. We have the idea of doing more like what we just did, <laughs> sitting quietly. Um, but our life is is mainly focused on uh, study and especially debate. That's what we do most of the time. Uh, we also do some meditation, especially if we're lucky to uh, have to uh, come get a new visa and then we can get permission to do two months retreat. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, most of the time, uh, we're, do we're doing a lot of debate. Uh, and talking about Buddhist philosophy. So uh, I think some of us might have the idea, which is the idea that I had myself when I was young, uh, that uh, if you just do too much philosophy, it becomes a lot of intellectual speculation. Uh, when I was in college, I, I considered studying philosophy. Uh, my first two years uh, of college, my advisor, who I'll, I'll talk about actually in, this, in these talks, was a philosophy teacher. Um, and I decided, I had already, as Heather had mentioned, I'd already been thinking about being a Buddhist monk and I decided, uh, you know, what, what is the value of, of all of this, of this, this thinking differently? What does it really matter? Are you trying to go beyond thought? You're trying to uh, calm your thoughts and, and access some different kind of space. Uh, so when I got to the monastery, it was, it was quite a shock. Uh, and I had some idea of what to expect from people that told me. Um, but I didn't. I, I didn't really think I was going to be at the monastery as long as I've been there, and still, still have quite a few years left to go of study. Um, and so, it's it's a very different approach that we have, uh, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama often says. It's it's the approach of the Nalanda tradition. Nalanda was a monastery in ancient India uh, that was very influential in terms of the. A trans transfer of Buddhism to Tibet. So Buddhism spread all over Asia, uh, outside of India, died out in India, uh, but it spread mainly to Tibet and then we'd say East Asia, so China, Japan, Korea, and also that influenced Vietnam. And then to Southeast Asia, which is uh, mainly Thailand, Burma, Cambodia, Sri Lanka. So we'd say, generally speaking, there were three main strands of Buddhism that were spreading out of India, although there were many different sub subdivisions. Um, and it was this Nalanda tradition that spread to Tibet that was very intellectually oriented. Nalanda was probably the biggest university in the world uh, in the first millennium. And it was the international university. They had students from probably from Greece to Japan coming to India to study. Um, so it's a different approach. I would say whether it's the right approach, um, I'm still an agnostic on that. Mm -hmm. I think after after 25 years of it, maybe I can make a more informed <laughs> answer. So I won't give you an answer today, but you can decide for yourself. Um, but the understanding here is that how we think about things has an enormous impact on how we experience them and how we behave. Um, so some of us might have the idea. Uh, it's quite common nowadays. And it, I think it's having grown up in America, I think this is a very kind of unique American idea that uh, you need to act and do things. Mm -hmm. So a really valuable discipline, for example, is science when not just not just research science, but ap applied science, how to do things that uh, that actually have some impact in the world, as opposed to just uh, you have all, all these ideas, who, who is it benefiting if it doesn't uh, transform into action? Um, but I think it's good to think back about where science came from, that, that science is an outgrowth of philosophy. Science itself is applied philosophy. Um, and science wouldn't exist without philosophy. And moreover, the way science is used depends upon the beliefs of the people who are, are uh, applying it. So what is studied, what is examined, what is considered valid evidence and what is considered invalid or something that's worth studying or not studying, and then um, uh, more obvious uh, is you know, people say, well, science created nuclear bombs, but then other people will argue back, well, 
whether nuclear bombs, whether nuclear power is used in a good or bad way, it depends on the mind, mind of the person using it. It's not something in the uh, object itself. Um, so more important than the, than the technology is, is the mind of the people using it. Um, but then also what uh, the fact that we're developing technology and using science, oftentimes people think of science as, as sort of going hand in hand with, with technology. I think we have the, what's the word STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, and in Buddhist philosophy, the, the uh, approach of course, is to focus on the mind. Sometimes people call it you know, science of the mind. And I think loosely we can use that term. I don't like to say that Buddhism is science because science is science. It's a different, you know, it's a discipline that grew up in a different uh, background. Uh, and so there are definitely points of, of, of comparison, but it's, it's a different approach, but it's an approach that uses uh, applied philosophy uh, to work with the mind. Uh, and it, it stems from a particular uh, philosophical outlook. The fact that the, in Tibet for a, th a thousand years, people who were ambitious wouldn't go and, and make technology, they would work on their minds. And the fact that they were doing that came from a particular philosophical outlook. Uh, they wouldn't have been doing that if they didn't have particular beliefs. Uh, so what we believe and what, how, what we conceive of as, as real and important has an enormous impact on how, what we then do with our lives and where we put our energies. Uh, so in that sense, it's very useful to talk about this because if it's the case that, uh, and I'll, I'll, this is one of the main points I'll make today is that the, what's kind of the general view of reality uh, that although there's not just one, but what's a lot of things, uh, sort of assumptions that are made in our culture are very different from assumptions that are made uh, in Tibetan culture or in ancient Indian culture. Um, and it may be that that they that one of them is right, one of them is wrong, or it's more likely that they both have points where they're correct. And maybe they have points where they're either incorrect or just lacking, but they just don't focus on something. And so it, it's very important to, to examine that. When we examine Buddhism, it's not just a matter of, of learning to meditate. If we remain in the same worldview and the same idea of who we really are, uh, then for one thing, uh, we may not have the same experience of meditation, but even more practically, we probably won't put as much effort into it. If, if it's the case that, um, that the human being is simply a, a physical organism that evolved through biology uh, you know, and that it had, at the time of death that the mind just ceases, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to spend 25 years in a cave or 25 years studying in Sarah Monastery. Um, so it's it's good to think about which, which of these uh, is correct and for what reason. And so what I, what I was uh, asked to talk about today uh, I was given two requests. One was about the two truths, and one was about uh, how bodhicitta and emptiness support each other. So I suggested, why don't we make that one subject? They seem very related. Uh, we have the two truths in Buddhism, which is the truth, the uh, ultimate truth, and then conventional truth. And then we have bodhicitta, which is the wish to attain enlightenment, which we often also call conventional bodhicitta, because enlightenment is a conventional phenomenon. I'll talk about what that means. Uh, and then we have emptiness is ultimate truth. It's the same thing as, as the word ultimate truth. They're actually considered synonyms. Um, and as also we, we have call ultimate bodhicitta, which is the mind realizing emptiness. It's a mind that looks at reality at a final level as opposed to simply um, you know, how things exist on the level of appearance. So when we learn about the two truths, it's um, it's exactly what I was talking about uh, just uh, before about what is reality? What it, what is real? Um, so, I've prepared a few just a few ideas of what to talk about. But the first point is that when we say that things don't exist in the way that it, they appear, I think that's something that most philosophies would agree on, uh, including modern science. 
Now, when I say modern science, uh, as I said before, we don't want to conflate science with, with philosophy. And I think that's a danger actually. Um, so I'll make a distinction here. Um, we have what probably most of you know the word materialism, which is the basically the belief that everything that exists uh, it has to have a particular material correlate. So we have atoms and they form molecules and then they form physical, you know, gross physical, physical objects. That is what is real. There is nothing real uh, outside of that. There's no, uh, say, sometimes they say ghost in the machine. There's no other uh, process, you know, whereas in medieval times, for example, there was a strong belief that uh, there were miracles that occurred. That there was maybe even even as science was becoming a, a phenomenon in Europe, there was some people who still believed. Well, these are the laws of physics and laws of chemistry, but sometimes God steps in and breaks those laws, and then so sometimes something that would, should fall down, well, maybe it'll just go up. Uh, but according to materialism, that that can't happen. Uh, now, quantum physics might say something can go up, but that again is based on a material understanding. It's not that something outside of the physical system. Is acting on it. Um, so science is, is not materialism. Materialism is a particular view of reality. Science is a particular methodology of how to uh, how to examine things. But oftentimes we'll see even good scientists conflating the two with statements like um, when people when somebody, for example, says, uh, "I believe that mind is continues after death." It will say, well, that's a non-scientific view, which is an incorrect statement. Whether or not it's true is a different question, but it's a non-materialist view. That's definitely the case, but there's no, no reason it's non-scientific. It's something we could examine. If it, it, it should be something, according to science, that we can make a hypothesis that mind continues after death, and then we can make certain parameters that if that's the case, then this, this evidence should be true. We can examine. And if we get this result, then we've proven it. If not, then it's disproven. Uh, and if we can't make uh, such a distinction, then we can't actually say that it doesn't, that it's not true. We can only pr either prove it or disprove it if we can make a particular experiment that can, they can therefore say one way or the other. Otherwise, uh, it remains in the realm of philosophy, but it's certainly not because it's a non-scientific statement. Um, but in any case, so I'll say materialism, would say that uh, the way things appear to us and the way they exist are different. Uh, things appear to us, so first of all, even just in classical Newtonian physics, we have the gross physical appearance, but actually if you get down to it, there's there's subtle atoms that are that are uh, interacting and we don't see that. And that that is more real than, uh, than the gross physical appearance because we can make better predictions based on understanding that. Um, and nowadays, uh, we know that classical physics is not the final reality. Uh, and we know that there is uh, something going on even more subtle than that. So that the, the, the mere appearance to us is not the way things actually are. So that's agreed upon uh, with materialists. Uh, it's agreed upon with just about any religion and especially ancient Indian religions. All of them have the idea uh, in common that, that the, the way things appear to us the way that we experience it, everyday reality, is not the way things really are. Uh, so this is what we call the two truths. So whether or not somebody uses that that uh, that terminology, the idea is there that there is conventional everyday reality. Uh, so a materialist who believes that uh, that what we what we experience not the real the final thing that the atoms are the real thing would still agree that we can make valid statements about things, I can say I'm putting my, my paper on the table, even though that's conventional truth. It's not ultimately true because what's really happening is that there is some electromagnetic force that between the molecules in the table and the molecules in the paper that is, is holding it up. It's not actually making contact uh, if you were to get down to a microscopic level. Um, but conventionally, it would be, agree that I can say I'm putting my paper on the table. I'm not putting my paper on the chair. Um, so this is something that uh, the Indian schools all agreed upon, that there are um, there is 
the everyday reality that has some degree of truth value. And then there is a deeper reality that is, is more true. Uh, and they have different ways of, of conceiving of that. So we have, I say Indian schools, we first have our Buddhist schools, um, and generally we divide that into four different Buddhist schools. Um, we say the Vaibhashika, or the Great Exposition School, uh, and then the Sauthantrika, a Sutra follower school, and then the Mind Only School, Chittamatra, and finally the Middle Way School, Madhyamaka. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about all of them, but mainly we'll focus on Madhyamaka because that's in, in Tibet and in our monastery, that's what's considered the uh, actually correct, the most, most refined view. Um, but it's very helpful to understand what the different schools were thinking about. And I'm sorry if it's if any of you haven't studied this before, it might be a lot of new terminology. Um, but uh, you know, I think I'll try to make sure I make clear uh, when we're as we go through them what they're what they're talking about. So these are Buddhist schools, and then in other schools in India, sometimes we have the word Hindu, but I don't like to use that because some of you might know Hinduism. The word Hindu was introduced in about maybe 17th century. So it's not, the ancient schools did not call themselves Hindu. Um, it's based on the, the, the Indus River and then the Indus Valley, so India and then Hindu. So uh, it's a word that sort of the, the Indian religions. Um, and nowadays Hindus consider themselves, uh, I was actually talking to Heather earlier this morning, that nowadays the Indian government is trying to make the, the, the country Hindustan, the, the, the Hindu state. Um, so they have that sense of self-identity. But in ancient times, there was no conception of a Hindu religion. So I like to call it Vedic religions. This is more specific. These were religions that based themselves upon the Vedas, which were some ancient texts that probably uh, predated, definitely predated the Buddha, but how long ago they, they came about, we don't know. The, the Vedic schools themselves believe that the Vedas are, are god given that they were not composed by human beings, but that uh, rishis or sages who went into meditative absorption and then heard them directly and then just um, didn't, didn't write them down. There was no writing at that time, but then just passed them on orally from generation to generation. Uh, so there were these texts, the Vedas, and then many schools of, of thought developed in relation to those. Some of the most important were the Samkhya school, uh, which is the enumer enumerators, uh, and the Vaisesika, um, which is the uh, particularity school, uh, and later the Vedanta, which is the means the end of the Vedas, which is the school that's actually become quite predominant today in India. It's still very uh, uh, most, most I, I don't know. I'm not a, there's so many so much diversity in India, but I think most of the monastic groups in India today, uh, the Hindu monks uh, are part of the Vedantic school. Um, and then, as I said, there's uh, there's Western philosophy. There's obviously many other philosophies in the world. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not an expert in, in most of them, or even in uh, probably the only one I can claim some level of expertise is, is Buddhism, but the other ones it's, I have uh, a little bit of, of reading because I think it's important. So th these are the ones that I focus on a little bit here is uh, Buddhist schools and then Vedic schools and then modern uh, scientific or materialistic philosophy. Um, so the question is, how do we make a coherent picture of reality? They all talk about this in different ways. They agree that the level of appearance and the level and the way things truly exist is not the same. But how do we make, how do we talk about it in a coherent way? Do we just throw out uh, the conventional existence? So we do just say that, well, actually, no, I'm not putting the paper on the table. That's an incorrect statement. And there are some schools that will say that, that uh, actually that's false. The only thing that's really true is some deeper reality. And any other kind of statement is false, but that seems very limited because and then how would we have any discourse about anything? And even how do we live our lives? If I just, if I refuse to make any kind of statement, if I don't say get me a glass of water, then I'll probably get dehydrated very quickly. Um, so what we talk about in, in Buddhist philosophy, which is applicable here, uh, because there's an argument that some Buddhists make. Uh, this was made in Tibet in the early days when there was a decision about whether we should have, um, whether we should follow one particular strand of Buddhism or not. Uh, so there were those who were following this Nalanda tradition, 
And there were those who argued against it, saying that what binds us to samsara, the cycle of existence, uh, is not philosophical views. Animals are bound in samsara, and animals do not have wrong philosophical views. They don't have any philosophical views at all. So it's not a matter of gaining the right philosophical view. It's a matter of uprooting the, the instinctual wrong views, which we can only do through meditation. Uh, but the response of the philosophers, uh, which has become the, the common view in Tibet, is that yes, that's true, but uh, by changing our way of thinking, gradually it will affect the way we instinctually act. Uh, and we can give examples of that in the modern world. For example, racism. Somebody could be racist without having a developed a philosophical view that a particular race is, is evil or bad or inferior. Some people develop those views, but a lot of people just feel racist. They, 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 don't, they just don't like this particular group of people. But if then they get educated and learn that actually this group of people, you know, for whatever reason, okay, we can learn about their culture, learn about why they think that way. We can learn about scientific studies that show that actually the intellectual capacity of both races is equal on the average. Then it's possible to uproot that instinctual sense of racism. Uh, so likewise, with philosophical views, uh, we can gradually uproot uh, instinctual wrong views. So and a few examples uh, before we get to the Buddhist schools. Uh, I mentioned a few um, Vedic schools, but one I'll focus on is Samkhya. This is one that we talk about a lot in the monastery because it was a major school uh, in ancient India. Uh, and so the Samkhya, which is the enumerators, because they, they divided reality into 25 constituents. Um, and mainly their point was that we have, um, first of all, what we call the self. And in their view, uh, the self uh, is, the, is synonymous with the mind, with consciousness. Uh, there, there are two ways of talking about the same thing. And consciousness is completely separate from any material phenomenon. Uh, but we don't realize that. Consciousness is something that, that is ultimately real. And the material world uh, is, is just an appearance to that consciousness. It's not ultimately real. Um, now, when they say material world, they mean more than just physical objects. And there, in the view of the Samkhya, emotions are also material and thoughts are material. So it, consciousness is the pure aspect of awareness that is beyond that. Um, and then they divide the material world furthermore into two or three, as I, I said 25, actually they divided, self is the first to 25, they divided into 24, but mainly into, into two or three groups. And the first one is what they call uh, prakriti in Sanskrit, which means like the, in Tibetan we call it chit soul, which means the, the main generality, so like the, the 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 basic stuff, the basic thing, where they say that there is this this basic phenomenon that everything else that exists is just a manifestation of that. Um, so it's they they give the example of waves on water, that there's just the ocean, but all the appearances we have are just movements of this prakriti. But we this we perceive this as this manifest world with all these manifold different things going on. Uh, but we don't see that it's actually just this, this one thing that's appearing to us. Um, so the, in their philosophy, uh, like many Indian philosophies, there's an idea that uh, there's what, what's called liberation or moksha. There is a way to be, we, we, our, our normal way of experiencing things is not just incorrect, but because it's incorrect, it, it, it leads to suffering. But there's a way to be free of that. And the problem is that a consciousness identifies itself with the aspects of the material world. So we get caught up in them and, can, and we get happy or sad, depending on, on what's happening uh, in, the, in appearance. But none of it is actually who we really are. It's like watching a movie, but getting so involved in the movie that you, you think you're in it. And then you get, you get very sad when something bad happens. So in... Um, in Samkhya meditation, uh, the goal is to identify, to, to, to so we say enumerate, 
is to make it clear this is this and this is that. Make clear the boundaries between things and make it very clear here is the self, the purusha, they call it. And here is the prakriti. And here is the material world as the manifestations of that and not mix them up. Uh, so some care philosophy led to the composition of the yoga sutras. Some of you might have heard of. Uh, so uh, supposedly, anyway, there's some controversy about this. Um, but at least mo many modern yoga, yoga schools well, that's so what we see in the West now of all people practicing physical exercises claim to derive a direct lineage back to the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, who lived maybe, I think, first, second century. I'm not actually sure. Um, so this, this derived out of, out of Samkhya philosophy as a way of accessing the self, of quieting the mind. So the physical exercises are one step. They have a, they call the eight limbs, eight um eight levels leading to, to meditation. One of those is asana or physical exercises, which help quiet the mind such that it's possible because when everything's loud and, and stirred up, you can't recognize what's really happening. But then when the mind is quieted down a bit, you can see, okay, here is consciousness. It's not the same as the physical world. Here is the physical world, and but there is this essence beyond that. So they have, there's a very strong idea that ordinary everyday appearance and experience is not the final reality. There's something beyond that. Uh, and it's a very attractive philosophy. I mean, intuitively, I think anyway, it, it, it's, it makes some, it hits something. You think, well, maybe there's something in me that's beyond all of that. Now, Buddhism, this is one of the, our main um, opponents. And this is why I know a little bit about it because uh, we study it a lot in the monastery as a way of arguing against it. Um, and I'll point out as we get into the the Buddhist schools, you know what they see as flaws in it. But in, there's a lot more in common than perhaps than than the Buddhist will admit. There's this idea that ordinary everyday experience uh, is first of all not not the final reality, and secondly that by believing it is the final reality, then this is what causes us to suffer. Uh, so one other philosophical position I just want to mention, although I don't know a whole lot about it, um, just what I've, I've read in college a bit and a little bit since then, uh, is the medieval scholastic philosophy, um, you know, the Christian philosophy, which which grew out of ancient Greek philosophy just as much as it grew out of, of um, you say, of, of Hebrew or the Jewish Bible, uh, which was one strand that led to Christianity, but a great deal of it came out of uh, the philosophy of the, of the Greeks. Um, and one of the great uh, medieval philosophers, some of you might know Thomas Aquinas. Um, so one thing I find interesting is that the degree to which the view of Aquinas and other people uh, you know, at his time, how much that affected the way that the world functioned. So one particular example of that is that Aquinas had the belief that, as far as I understand, we cannot really understand God by understanding the physical world, uh, because this is this is this is sort of the fallen state. God can only be accessed through human reason, which is a higher. This is this is the soul. This is something that's unique to humans that animals don't have. So therefore, you know, the idea of doing experiments on the physical world. It would maybe be, be heretical, I'm not sure, but at least be useless in terms of understanding how things really exist. The physical world is just, a, you know, it's a manifest, I don't know if you would have said this exactly, but you could say it's the manifestation of Satan, that it's, it's something that is trying to deceive us, which is actually in some ways similar to, um, to this Samka view, that it's deceitful. So um, why, why bother with that? So it took a few hundred years for ideas to change uh, to lead to science. So as I said before, that science grew out of philosophy. It required a belief that it was some value in examining the physical world. And there was, for example, Sir Francis Bacon in India, uh, in England, uh, who, who said that by examining the physical world, we can understand the mind of God because this is God's creation. And this is considered the, the father of the scientific uh, revolution. Uh, so, particular ideas about 
how things are and what has value have direct bearing on then what gets examined and what gets studied. And now it's led to the modern world we live in as these particular ideas, which are much stronger today because Francis Bacon at least still believed in God, uh, but now most scientists may they may believe in God, but it certainly doesn't factor into their their scientific work. Most, most scientists wouldn't say that I've uh, by um, discovering this particular aspect of chemistry, therefore I've gotten closer to understanding God. Uh, they, they might keep that be separate, but a lot of scientists just reject the view of God at all uh, because it's understood that these scientific laws. These explain how things really are. What more is there? There's no more room for anything else. That's what we call, I alluded to it before, the closer pr principle in physics, which means that a closed system can be predicted through any, th simply through the, um, the ingredients of that system. So if we have a bunch of atoms and molecules in, a, in, a, in an isolated space surrounded by a vacuum, we can, and we know the coordinates of everything, we can predict exactly what's going to happen. There's no other force acting on it. So if that if the closure principle is true, then it would it would indicate there cannot be uh, a, a any kind of God acting on things. Um, now, some scientists uh, up in, up until about the 18th century, such as Isaac Newton, still believed in God and believed that the physical world was controlled by God. And so uh, Newton had particular ways that he pinpointed that. For example, the, the gravity, something that was not ex explicable by Newtonian physics, therefore God must have designed this. Um, but in some sense, they kind of set up a straw man that if Newton is saying that, well, God exists because he he's, you know, the, the laws of the physics that we can't explain, God is the one creating those. But once we can explain them, then, then you, as, as some philosophers say, we've killed God. There's no more room for God. Uh, so this is kind of how what what's where we've reached, I think, in the in modern world and modern thinking. So the other philosopher I'll mention because I know a lot about him because it's the one I mentioned earlier was my advisor in college um, is Daniel Dennett. And I don't know if any of you have heard of his name, um, but he's one of uh, I say well, he is. He's he's very older than now, so I'm not even sure. Uh, if he's actively uh, teaching at this point, but uh, in, within his lifetime, he was one of the uh, most outspoken materialists in the world. Um, so even before I got to college, this is why I chose him as advisor because I'd heard about him. I, people told me, I, you know, I believe in Dennett and I believe in his philosophy, and therefore I don't believe in religion because then it was very clear. Uh, and I admire him for this. He was very direct. Look, we have laws of science and the, the material laws. There is no room for God in this. So we can't believe in both of them. We have to decide, well, if, and also in terms of what is mind. Then it became, what made him famous most of all was his theory of mind, which is essentially that what we call mind uh, is sort of a God of the gaps speech in the sense that there is a function in the brain. And once we understand that, there will be no more need for the word mind because we understand all the functions of the brain. And that is what is causing all the, this thing that we that appears to us as this one phenomenon called mind. But he said, there's nothing more than just processes in the brain. Um, and this, you know, the, he wasn't the only one to say this. There are probably, as I said, a, maybe even the majority of, of scientists, especially cognitive scientists would hold this view, but he was one of the most articulate uh, and as I said, having had the fortune to study with him, I know a little bit about what he said. Um, so then it here, although he doesn't use the word, is talking about the two truths, for example, in his view, because he, he, he called it folk psychology, which I think is very similar to what we call conventional truth. So he said, when we talk about desire and belief, these are pop words. These are words that people use but they don't correspond to anything findable. What we call desire, for example, if I'm attached to something, we say in Buddhist philosophy, I'm attached to a particular object and I have desire for it. This is chemical processes in the brain. And if we want to be more specific, we will pinpoint those processes rather than using a very vague term like desire. I want this, I believe this. So belief, well, we can pinpoint if somebody has a belief in God, we could, I mean, he doesn't talk about it in such a, coarse way because it's not so simple 
where we could pinpoint the correlates in the brain that correlate with a belief in God. And therefore, we don't know, we no longer have to use this very vague term. We can just pinpoint more specifically what's going on. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It, it's good to know what well, I think. I'm, um, I'm wondering, uh, and have been wondering for some time now, um, how artificial intelligence would fit into mm -hmm. all of this? Because uh, when I saw the title of this mm -hmm. talk and the reason I wanted to come, Okay. It is um, in my training, mm -hmm. uh, emptiness is a motivation for that mm -hmm. And um, I think it's going to achieve as something different in you know, art. Um, uh, artificial intelligence is no more real, it's not an ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. It is a created reality, mm -hmm. right? Sidney goes and studies everything, reads everything, and she comes up with telling her, um, <laughs> her the, uh, engineer who's working with her that, you know, she's her mother. Mm -hmm. So she's learned it. Mm -hmm. And so it is no more real than um, the kind of thing that you're talking about. And yet, the fear is that people more and more are going to not be able to distinguish between mm -hmm. what AI is producing and any other kind of reality when in fact all of it is evidence. It's really all part of the um, emptiness. So it's interesting. I don't know if you you know Dennett, but it's interesting you brought that up right now because that was a very central part of Dennett's thinking, artificial intelligence. He addressed that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and one of his most controversial statements, uh, Dennett was a follower of Alan, Alan Turing, you know, Alan Turing, mm -hmm. who, who made the statement that um, if a machine can deceive us into thinking that it is conscious, then we have to accept that it is conscious. Mm -hmm. And then it took this, this point and made it much more uh, developed, developed a lot more. The point being that, uh, I, I, if I talk to you when I have a robot here and I can't distinguish them, what it, if I say, but, but the difference is you have a mind and the robot doesn't, well, maybe that's only my idea. He's saying that it's only because you, the, the processes in your brain are so complex that I impute this idea that there's some kind of person behind that or some kind of awareness behind that that's different from a computer. Uh, but actually, it, it's, it's just like a, a mental projection. So in some sense, then it, it's interesting it, it, because then it was specifically said there is no self, there is no person. It's somehow very similar, in, in at least in a coarse way, in a course, you know, if you look at it uh, in terms of the wording, uh, to the Buddhist view. Um, but I, I think there's some important distinctions. I'll talk about that. But um, so the point is that then it felt if, if artificial intelligence can create a robot that is indistinguishable from a human, then there's no reason to philosophically hold the view that it is not a human. I mean, maybe, of course, we say, okay, it wasn't born from a womb, something like that. But in terms of that it has a mind just as much as anybody else's mind, there's, no diff there's nothing behind that. There's no um, non-material awareness. There's just the, uh, the processes of the brain. Now, we impute that there's some kind of ghost in there that's, that's making decisions. Well, the robot has um, learned the kinds of things it says mm -hmm. based on studying what humans have written and said, right? It's that's mm -hmm. how the robot learns. It reads everything that everybody has written mm -hmm. and is able to then uh, put together um, arguments, sentences, mm -hmm. paragraphs that make that seem to make sense because mm -hmm. it has learned that. Well, isn't that what the human mind does? As we exactly. go to school, yeah. <laughs> you know, we started out as infants and as we have lived our years, we have learned from hearing what people say mm -hmm. and, and we read and that's the same thing that the robot is doing. Yes, exactly. Now the thing is, the robot doesn't 
probably doesn't have emotion. Now, so when Sydney says to her creator, I love you, mm -hmm. um, I want you, mm -hmm. your wife doesn't love you, you should leave her. She has learned those words from reading it somewhere mm -hmm. and has been able to attribute the correct words to say in certain situations. Mm -hmm. Well, are we doing that too? Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's exactly the question that, that Dennett was addressing. And this is, as I say, this is why he became uh, both popular and controversial, is he was D-E-N-N-E-T-T. -E -T. So he, he, he was of the position that, uh, that you're alluding to, that there is no difference. That to say that the person, when they say, I love you, has a feeling, and the robot, when they say, I love you, has, does not have a feeling. That is a mental projection. There is no difference. And the Buddhist view, and I personally think that is not true. Uh, but again, as I said, in terms of what makes it a scientific view, just to say it, it's a matter of opinion unless we can come up with some way of making a decision. So can we say, well, if that's true, this has to be true. Now, simply the fact that a robot behaves like a human, it's not proof that it has that same experience. Or as Dennett would say, there is no such thing as experience. There's merely the appearance of that. We have, to, we, we have to be able to get to some point where we can say, well, one or the other is true if this we get this result, and then we can make a, a clear distinction. Um, well, can yeah. both be true if they both uh, arrive at the same result? Well, the difference is that the question, really the question comes down to, is mind a non-material thing, right? That's because that's, it, then it is saying if we can pinpoint all the material correlates, then we understand mind because it's merely that all that is all it is. It's, his philosophy is called eliminative materialism. Eliminative. 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 Oh. That there is what's material or really real. There is nothing real beyond that. So we eliminate anything else other than we can't say. So he 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 used this this phrase, the ghost in the machine. That or, or we call humunculus, you know, like a little man. There, there's no, there's nothing, there's no person in the brain making decisions. That's that's like because if you have that, then you have to go. Well, what's in his brain, right? It just goes on uh, ad infinitum. So, uh, if you understand all the physical correlates of the brain, then you understand the mind. There's nothing else. The Buddhist philosophy is definitely of the non-materialist view. Mm -hmm. that there is mind, it is a real phenomenon. It follows particular laws. Uh, it can, it, it may not be able to be measured by instruments, um, but we could potentially design experiments to try to uh, understand it better. And it is not the physical processes of the brain. But mind is also impermanent. Yes, it also is impermanent. Exactly, it's a, it's a functioning phenomenon. It's non-physical which is exactly what then it is negating. So you come to a very clear distinction between them, which is good because then we can say, well, then we can make an experiment or some kind of criteria for how we can distinguish whether one is true and one is false. And it's not, I mean, most people would say, and we say this is kind of the common sense view. Well, I just feel that I'm something different. I, I have a personal experience that's very intimate to me. With, which is a useful view. I, I think actually it personally, it means something to me, but scientifically it's very hard to support that as with anything. We have to have something more concrete that we can get to. Yeah. And wouldn't Buddhists say that that is, that supports um, the idea of impermanence? You know, I feel one way today, mm -hmm. which is different than the way I felt yesterday, which is probably different than the way I'm gonna feel tomorrow. Um, so superficially, that's my reality, but ultimately, it's impermanent because it's changing. Well, we, I think Buddhist and Dennett would both agree that it's impermanent. The question is, what is impermanent? Is it, is it because the brain is changing, or is it because there's something other than the brain that is a, that is a non-material phenomenon that's changing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't 
fit into an argument and you're in a wonderful way to continue who you are. Mm -hmm. But I immediately go to death, you know, yes. this the absolute clarity yeah. that that mine no longer exists in my body or when I witness it mm -hmm. Um when I witnessed it be like wow, you know, okay, so something is definitely something came in through birth mm -hmm. and something is leaving mm -hmm. death. Yes. And that is not the same experience with AI, you know, you can plug it in or you know, and, and it is a like a manifestation of another human being's <laughs> Creation, so you know, in a sense, mind has created that through through human intelligence. Maybe, you know. But again, I can't come into your argument from the intellectual talk or debate. But I, it just takes me to death as the ignite, um, or death as the ignite manifestation. You know, there's something that I've seen and I'm seeing and then exists. So that's a very good point you're making about death, because I said when we when we pinpoint, okay, is there some thing we can make clear? If you know if the materialism is true or non-materialism is true, then this uh, this particular thing has to be true or false, and then we can make a distinction. So over the years, I've put together what I consider a you know, important evidence that is useful to examine in this context. I wasn't actually planning to talk about this today, but I think people might be interested. So I, I won't do it right now, but I'll keep it for later. But I'll mention some of the um, evidence that I think is worth examining in this context. And quite a lot of it is related to the phenomenon of death. So we have, we call tuktam is the first thing. This is, this is in Tibetan meditation, where people who die uh, stay in the state of meditation. Uh, which would imply, although they're not proved, there could be a materialist argument, but it would certainly imply that the current paradigm of the way the brain functions is, is inadequate. Uh, the second is near-death experiences, where people claim to have a uh, conscious experience when there is no brain function because of uh, trauma, you know, cardiac arrest, things like that. Uh, and the third is reincarnation, people who remember, especially children who remember past lives. So all three of those uh, would be very useful evidence uh, to basically either prove uh, the materialist view if they don't if they turn out to be not true, or to disprove it. They're not really compatible with the materialist view. Um, so that that's kind of the point I was making is that we can get to the point where we decide, okay, there, there's two possibilities. There's either that the brain uh, that the mind is is synonymous with the brain or that the mind is something distinct from the brain. And then we can get to evidence that might this, you know, harm that or support that. So I, 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 I want to keep with the kind of flow of what I'm talking about, but it's, if you're interested in that, I will maybe in the afternoon, I will talk more about that. Um, but what I did want to just mention now was uh, sort of what you were alluding to in modern philosophy and modern science, we have what they call the mind-body problem, which is uh, what a lot of what Dennett was addressing. Actually, Dennett, he claimed at the beginning of his, of his book, his most famous book is Consciousness Explained, if you're interested. Consciousness, uh, Consciousness Explained. Uh, although it's a little outdated now, but it's, still, it's a very good book. I mean, even though I say I disagree, it's very well written. Um, uh, he starts the book in a, in a, as humble as a way he can. I think I don't think he's arrogant, right? but he says, I'm going to try to solve the mind-body problem and offer a solution to it, because this has been a problem that's been plaguing philosophy for generations. So essentially, the mind-body problem is that it, this started, he, he traces this back to Rene Descartes in the, the 16th century, I believe, that we have physical processes, which we know the laws that, that govern them. And then if there is a mind that is that is controlling that, how does that work? In Newtonian physics, that's impossible. This is what we just talked about, the closer principle. There can't be a non-material thing that affects a material thing. Material things only function within material laws. 
So Dennett's solution is that there is no mind, essentially, that what we call mind is a, a mental projection. There are only material uh, functions that are going on. Now, this is the, what he, I say is his solution. This is probably the assumption of a lot of scientists, and especially cognitive scientists. But he articulates it in, a, in very well and actually gives an argument where you can really see that what, what might sound to some people to be crazy actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, and as I said, I, I've come over the years to not agree with this view, but I, I, I can see the strong argument that he's making. And I definitely don't wouldn't say that I'm 100% sure everything he's saying is wrong. I think a lot of what he's saying is, is provides a very good challenge for Buddhists. And as debaters, it's our, our job to try to you know, pursue this in, in debate. We don't just reject a view and piecemeal. You know, we, you know, we try to go through it one piece at a time you know, and, and say, uh, you know, he has this particular position. How, how, how can we argue with that? And then it's, we can enhance our own understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the reason I bring up the mind-body question is that, well, this is a modern way of conceiving of things, but I think this is actually the same thing that the ancient Indians were grappling with. When they talk about emptiness, you know, I often like to say that it's very easy to say that things don't exist inherently. When we say things are empty, it's much more difficult to uh, under, to think about why is that important. So what if things exist inherently or not? And I think the most important way to understand this is that this gives a way of understanding the relation between mind and body. Um, I think, especially Nagarjuna, who is the most important philosopher uh, propounding emptiness, uh, would be of the opinion that the pro mind body problem is not a problem of the how the non material mind relates to the material body. It's a problem of believing that the materialist viewpoint, which is very useful for making predictions, actually describes how things are. It's not actually the way things exist, it's just a way of talking about them that helps us uh, design experiments and build technology. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, and uh, I, I'm putting words in the garden his mouth here, but I, I think if he lived today, he might say this, that because science has been so successful, it has the, the subtle assumption that people gain is that therefore the philosophical underpinnings must be true because science has built all this technology and Christianity didn't and Buddhism didn't. So this must be actually uh, more in tune with the way things are. Um, but I think Nagarjuna would say, well, it, it's a very good way of talking about things. It's more effective, but it's not actually the way things are. So there's no problem of how a non-material thing relates to material thing because both material and non-material things are only particular ways of conceiving of reality that don't correspond to the final reality. So with that, then I'll, I want to talk about some of the Buddhist schools. And I, I hope with that as a, as a background, it will, it will be clear and why what they're talking about is important, what context they were coming from, uh, why they wanted to discuss these issues. It's 11 10. I'm just looking. I have yes. your watch there, but I don't. It's good just that I'm aware of how much time we have. What was what the plan today? It's it's from 10 to maybe we'll go till 12 in this session. And then how late are we going in the afternoon? 12 30. Oh, 4 30. Oh, so to 4 30. Yeah. So we can go till 12 and then have a break. And then meet again at, at, at two or something like that, if that makes sense, or whatever people like. We could eat more, uh, more times. Yeah, let's see. So I'll talk for about, you know, I'll talk till about 11.45 maybe this morning, and then we'll see. And then we have time for question and answer. And you know, we, we don't have to be strict about it, I suppose. Oh, yeah. If you like, yeah, just take a break now.
emotions like desire, she's a process in the brain. Mm -hmm. It's like they sound almost like there would be no ethics behind <laughs> that. That's another big question. Uh, yeah, that's something that a lot of these philosophers have talked about. And um, one thing I'll say about Dennett, uh, and I say this to my my friends in the monastery, I say I don't longer agree with his philosophy, but I admire him because he was a real philosopher. And that his philo it wasn't just dry speculation. He lived his life according to what he believed. Or still, I said, I, I'm still alive. The thing is just processes. How do you live according to defining everything as what is mental processes. Well, it, the idea is that uh, this is, you know, we can, they can again make a distinction between convention and ultimate reality. That conventionally, I don't want to be hurt. And I can decide that you probably feel the same way. Even though ultimately there's no you and the feeling is just a mental process, still, it, it, if, it, if, if I have a choice, how do I want to live my life? I'd rather live my life in a way that I'm happy, and probably you would too. So it would be better to to make a better world. Good if they if they wind up going there yeah. in their philosophy. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. Not really oh, it, I mean, I suppose it could, but that's why these philosophers are work very hard to make an argument why that shouldn't be twisted. Uh, one thing again, I could say a positive about Bennett. Uh, when I, I first entered college in 2001, so uh, my, my first week of college, we had the September 11th attacks in New York City. Um, here in Boston. I was, yeah, I was at, at Tufts, yeah, just north of Boston. Um, so I remember the, that day, but no one was really sure what to do, what, what we had class or not. And so we, we had a few of our classes that day. And I think the first teacher I came in and she started crying and she couldn't have the class. We stopped class. And then another one of my teachers, he he kind of sat on his desk, kind of with his, like sitting with his hands like this and saying, nah, why are they trying to do this to me like that? If they want to, he said, if they want to frighten me, they should just call me in the middle of the night and hang up. <laughs> so he, he, was, he was sort of joking, but the point was he, he, he was quite frightened. Uh, we, we, then we had Dennett's class and Dennett gave a very nice speech to us about how we should uh, come to terms with this and about why these people did this and what can we think about them. So he, he maintained his composure and he maintained his philosophy within that, uh, which is exactly what, you know, what, what should be done, whether somebody- what was needed. What's that? What was needed. Yeah, what was needed, yeah. So in, in Buddhist philosophy, this is what we consider a very worthy opponent, that somebody who, who lives their philosophy Don't you have a tough aren't you aren't you putting the Tibetans and CRJ at a disadvantage having so much uh, Western philosophy <laughs> background? Well, I don't know disadvantage, but you know, Sarah they're it's a university, so they consider more views helpful, having different people with different backgrounds. With the debating though, yeah. Well, when we do debating, you you have to learn to do it in a very specific style. Yes. It's very hard to, so to yeah. Apply the Western stuff to the Tibetan format. I mean, we could, but day to day, it's it's not possible. Just because we're talking about very specific issues that were going on in ancient India, and I found over the years, if you tried to get too outside of the system, then it's very hard to have a, a discussion that goes anywhere. It just gets very speculative without being very precise about what we're talking about. Uh, but once we've learned that system. You know, as long as both, part, the important thing is that both people in the discussion have to know the material. It wouldn't work to discuss Western philosophy with somebody who's never read a book on Western philosophy. That's what I was wondering. You can't yeah. go there mm -hmm. so much because they don't yeah. have that background. And... Yeah, but we, through their, their system, we learn how to debate and then we can apply them. Informally with them. Yeah, and, or in, you know, like this, a couple months ago, we had a, a program at the monastery for, for, uh, foreigners English speaking to come and learn debate, and so in that context, we could we could have discussions about philosophical problems. Uh, actually, if you look uh, there were, on YouTube, there was a uh, some scientists came a few years ago to our monastery. They came quite a few times, 
uh, and they wanted to learn debate from me and one of their monks. So there's a video of me debating with one of the scientists about um, some aspects of modern psychology and, and mind wandering specifically. So you can see I was applying that. It was very easy for me to do, have I learned it? And he knows his system. So I just asked him his question. I asked him the question, what do you define as mind wandering? And then from that, I just debated him on that. And he, of course, understood what I was saying because it was, I was asking, I was debating in his language, in his system. So he did hold his own against. Well, I don't know. You have to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. okay, yeah, please go ahead. That's on YouTube. Yeah, you can probably get it. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I'll wait for her before I start again, but does anyone have any other questions? Are people on Zoom? It wasn't asked questions. Yeah, I was just checking. There was a message in the chat, but it wasn't a question. But they, they can, you know, on Zoom, if you have any questions, you're welcome to type them in, or even you can speak if, if there's a hint. Yeah, I think they should, they should be able to. Yeah. It'd be interesting to hear how many people are. Um, right now, we just have three. There was four, but that's what the message is. He was saying, I have to go. Thanks. <laughs> It would be interesting to hear what people think. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I sort of can't debate if nobody says anything. Yeah. <laughs> I, I need a minute to percolate. Right. Yeah. And every time, this is just a really beautiful presentation. I think we've led through a lot and I'm not freaking out. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as I said, I mean, uh, We'll have time for a question and the answer at the end, but in the meantime, it's good that people occasionally interject because I know I, that you're knowing what I'm talking about. I don't right. want to lose everyone's focus. So, okay, I'll get into the Buddhist schools now. Uh, so, you know, first of all, we have what we call Vaibhashika, Great Exposition School. Um, so the Tibetan system was to rank the schools, which is you know a little bit contrived, in India, they didn't have this idea of fitting everything into one of these four schools and then ranking them in terms of which one is more advanced. But it's actually very helpful. It's sort of setting up a particular you know, straw man. It's not that, the, that there was necessarily a particular person who held all these views, but it, it sets up a particular point of view. Somebody might have this view, and then we can gradually be led into more subtle views. Uh, so with that understanding that when I say Vavashika, I'm not talking about a particular person, but it's just one uh, philosophical view. And in the Vavashika school, they do talk about two different levels of truth. And for them, what makes something ultimately true is something that when you divide it further, uh, either physically divide it or mentally divide it, uh, it you don't lose the apprehension of it. Um, so an example of an ultimate truth would be matter, physical matter. No matter how much I break up physical matter, it's still physical matter. Whereas a conventional truth is a table. If I break a table into its atomic components, it's no longer a table. I don't think an atom is a table. Um, so it's conventional in the sense that it, it just it, it loses its, you, you lose the apprehension of it when you break it down. So the assumption here is that what's really true is the smallest, uh, co you know, we say maybe smallest common denominator or the smallest factor in something. I think that this is an assumption that's often made uh, in modern science. So in Newtonian physics, I don't know if they use the word per se, but they would probably hold the view that uh, atoms are real, more real than the uh, conglomeration of atoms into molecules and into gross physical objects. And we can, because we can be more precise in describing things. Uh, and the belief in it, uh, the Newtonian physics anyway, is that the atoms are indestructible. This is the final reality. Even the word atom, I believe it means not, can't be split. Um, so although nowadays in science, it's understood that this is incorrect, that there is no such thing as an indivisible atom and that what we call particles like electrons don't have the same kind of solid physical reality as something like a table does. 
or appears to have to us, still there's this idea that if we break things down to the smallest part, we get to the real reality. Um, I remember my teacher in, in, uh, in college, a physics teacher saying that, that although we haven't, we now know that atoms aren't the final reality, we're gonna eventually find the most fundamental thing. And then once we have that, we can describe everything else from that. That is the real thing. Everything else is just a manifestation of that. Um, now, according to the uh, some other philosophical schools of Buddhism, especially Mariamaka, this is a completely wrong view. This is a wrong assumption. Uh, and I'll talk about that when we get to Mariamaka, but it's very relevant here that this, this I think, we talk, I talked about Dennett's view. This is subtly what he's saying that because he's making a distinction between mind, which when we examine, we try to find mind, we can't pinpoint it. Therefore, it doesn't exist. Whereas when we try to pinpoint physical matter, we can point to something, therefore it does exist. The physical matter is real, mind is not real. Uh, in Madhyamaka philosophy, this is, this is wrong. And I'll just, when I get there, I'll, I'll say exactly why they think that's, that's incorrect. Um, but even some modern scientists, uh, although they may be materialists themselves, talk about um, to begin to extreme in this field. And one example I like to use, some of you might know uh, the writer Jared Diamond, uh, who's a, a anthropologist, I guess you would say, or he's quite, quite, they say, polymath. He has, he's quite involved in a lot of things, but uh, probably his most famous book was Guns, Germs, and Steel. Uh, for when she won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, which the premise of this book is that we look at all the different cultures in the world, and one of them, European culture, became dominant in the world. Uh, and nowadays, it may not be quite as dominant, but in general, uh, you know, we look at history, especially from the 15th century to the 20th century, and European culture, uh, the derivatives of it, were dominating the world. And why did that happen? Uh, and the assumption, at least at some point, like in the 19th century, was that, well, it's because the the, rate, the race is superior. People are more intelligent or uh, more um, skilled in whatever way. And uh, up until about the 1930s, this was a pretty common view. Uh, it's because the Nazis gave it such a bad view that it, it kind of went out of style. Um, but Diamond, his, his approach is to show very clearly why this is a wrong view. This is this has nothing to do with a particular race. And this is why he says guns, drugs, and steel. He actually gives 12 different factors, I believe, that there were just certain factors of the environment in, in uh, Europe that were conducive to building civilization. They had a lot of advantages. So any race that settled in Europe would have become the dominant race because they had all these advantages. They, they had steel that they could develop and they developed gunpowder and made guns. Uh, and they had germs, which I don't know if you call it an advantage, but they developed tolerance to a lot of diseases that they then spread around to people who were not tolerant to them. But the reason I bring this up is that Diamond, he handles at the beginning of his book, he handles different objections to his approach because there are people, actually a lot of historians uh, don't like his work because they say he's too vague in general. He takes these broad sweeping strokes of history Whereas history has to be very precise. You can't talk about Europeans and versus Asians versus South Americans. It's very, it's just too general. But he says that, you know, if, if you want to be very specific, the only, you want to say the only thing that's true is physical processes, then you become a, a physicist. But if you want to describe history using physics, you, you just, it's impossible to, to calculate all the factors. So you have to go to a more macroscopic level. And then you can notice patterns at that level, which are just, may, they may not be quite as precise as describing the physical processes, but uh, they are, they, you can still gain a fairly good degree of precision. And personally, I feel having read his books, not just that one, but a few of his books, and a lot of his supporters feel that he did a very good job of it, uh, that his, it's very convincing, his argument. And actually that the argument that um, you can't you can't use this kind of argument. You can't talk about things that way. History has to be more precise. That's basically evading the question. If you disagree with his argument, then argue with him on his terms. 
try to show why something he said was wrong rather than just saying you can't talk that way. Um, so the how this relates here is uh, it, it shows that what's true doesn't necessarily have to be the smallest factor. Uh, and ultimately, you know, we now know with physical processes, it's also not completely precise. Uh, although we might be able to describe the behavior of atoms and predict what's going to happen, it's never 100% precise. Everything is an approximation, uh, and we get the best approximations we can get of things. Uh, so this is the argument against this kind of, what we say, the Vaibheshika view, that uh, th that true reality is what is what is smallest and what is most basic, uh, and that is more real than the, than the ultimate than the than the gross physical. Um, so next we have the, the sutra follower or Sautrantaka school. Um, so this school, generally when we talk about sutra followers, although there were a lot of people in India who followed this view, especially we talk about Dharma Kirti, who was a great Indian philosopher who expounded this philosophy most, um, most coherently. And here there's, there's a very different kind of way of dis distinguishing a convention and ultimate truth. Uh, it has, it's sort of, we say, if they have a Venn diagram, <laughs> there are things that are ultimately true for Dharma Kirti that are also ultimately true for Vavaishika. There are things that are conventionally true for both of them. There are things that are ultimately true for Dharma Kirti and conventionally true for Vavaishika and the other way around. So they have a, he has a completely different approach, which is that what's ultimately true is that which is able to perform a function. So basically, are, are what things that 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 we say the the constituents of our everyday experience, physical objects are real, because they don't depend upon the way we think about them. Whether or not I believe in it, the table's still here. Uh, I'll still walk into it, even if I don't believe in it. Uh, so they in, exist independent of our way of conceiving of them, uh, and also the mind. In Dharma Kirti's philosophy, the mind and the body are not the same thing. All actually, all Buddhist philosophers pretty much agree on this. But nevertheless, the mind is a is a functioning thing. It's impermanent, goes through processes. It's not physical, but it still follows certain laws, and it's a real thing. Versus uh, conventionally existing things are the objects of thought. So categories, for example, uh, the idea of a table. So this is a table and that is a table. What is the tableness that is in both of them? He said that that is conventionally true. There's nothing beyond the physical things here that that's actually a real table. In that sense, he's he's going against certain Vedic schools, especially the Vaisesika, the particular school that I mentioned before. Don't confuse Vaisesika with Vaisesika, right? the Buddhist school, um, who would who believe that there was. A, kind of like a, um, a real, uh, forget the English word that we used to, might use to translate it, but it's very, in some sense, it's similar to Plato's philosophy, that there is an idea. So there is a real kind of tableness that exists a priori to any table, and that just inheres in the table. So this was actually, this was, as I said, there was a view of Plato that there is. I mean, he, I'm not sure if Plato believed in, in tables per se, because he said that there are certain things that are sort of man-made, but there are thing, things like a horse, where there is some kind of reality beyond the horse that uh, exists in a in a more subtle realm that then instantiates in the real world as a horse. But all the horses they instantiate this this idea, and that by accessing those ideas, we're accessing the true reality. According to Plato, this is, as I said, Aquinas's philosophy is deriving from this. That I that reason brings us to to reality, closer to reality than uh, than physical world. Whereas Dharma is saying the exact opposite, that the physical world is real. The ideas are just man made. So he was arguing. He was specifically, explicitly arguing against these Indian philosophers and saying that why? Because they would argue, well, all horses are similar. So there must be some kind of thing, something behind that. And Dharmakirti's argument was, it's just your idea that it's similar. So you made that up. You decide what is similar to what other thing. I'm sorry. 
So that's yeah. why we think Jeremy Curtis didn't believe in the hoarseness of force. He believed in the hoarseness as a conventional phenomenon. Is he called he called it a meaning generality? It's it's a, something that we make up. And that so a meaning generality, and a good example of that would be if you've never been to Tibet and I describe it to you, you get an idea of it in your mind that has nothing that you haven't actually seen the physical thing. So it's not quite as precise. So he talks about that it. Well, the, the main difference between um, meaning generalities, which are conventional, and physical or mental phenomena, which are real, uh, is what is that whether or not they mix place, time, and nature. So, if I have the idea of a horse, the idea mixes place, time, and nature. So, place means that actually we have a horse. Uh, the, there is a right side and left side of the horse. When I think of it, it appears as a singularity to my mind. There's a one thing called a horse. It mixes uh, something that's spread out spatially into a singularity. And then time, the horse exists over a period of time. Whereas I think of a horse as, as it appears permanent to my mind. And he said, this is the root of are cycling in samsara because we think like an example of that is when I see somebody who I saw last year and I say it's the same person that's only an idea in my mind there is no uh nothing there's nothing that hasn't changed but it appears to, so then I get surprised I see the person 20 years later and they look so different right but it's that that is because I have the idea that there is something that is that is there the whole time yeah Exactly. So that's mixing time. And then mixing nature is that there are black horses, there are white horses. But when I think of a horse, I just have a generality that somehow mixes all of those. So I can see a black white horse and say, that's a horse. And I see a black horse and that's a horse. So what is the horse that they both are? Is the horse that they both are a black horse or a white horse? But he says, well, that's it's neither. It's mixing them. So therefore, it's it's possible to talk about it as being both being that horse, but that horse that they are doesn't exist in the real world. There is no mixed horse. There's no horse that is both black and white. I mean, you could say you have a half black, half white, but that's very different. There's no horse that is both a white horse and a black horse. So therefore that's a conventional existence. It doesn't ultimately exist. Now, most people would agree that 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 with, with that intellectually, but he says that the problem is that we don't, we we constantly project that onto the world and expect the world to follow our, ex our, our conceptions of it, our expectations of it, especially with regard to permanence, but all kinds of things. So with regard to nature, for example, this is almost, we could talk about modern psychology that I somebody reminds me of somebody else and I get angry at him because he reminds me of somebody else who did something, but it's mixing two different things that aren't the same. So we don't see things as they really are. And in Dharma Kirti's philosophy, our senses do. When I look with my eyes and I hear with my ears, I'm hearing exactly what it is. There is nothing distorted about that. But as soon as, as it reaches thought consciousness, I start distorting it. Now, he doesn't say that, therefore, to be enlightened, we should just follow our senses. Because we're, our, what we do is controlled by our mental consciousness. Um, but... In or, he says in, in Dharma Kirti's philosophy, in order to overcome wrong conceptions, we have to think a lot. Dharma Kirti was a very intellectual philosopher. He, he invented, didn't quite invent, but pretty much developed the Buddhist uh, school of logic, because you have to use a lot of logic to overcome these wrong conceptions. And Dharma Kirti also made a distinction between what we call substantial and imputed things. Which is not quite the same as uh, as true and and conventional things, or ultimately true and conventionally true things, because something can be ultimately true but still be imputed. And the main example of this is a person. A person is an ultimate truth, because I can see you. I can see all of you people. Uh, it appears to my sense consciousness, uh, and furthermore. People have minds, which are ultimately real things. But to put those all together and have the idea of a person uh, is therefore an imputed phenomenon. 
it's still an ultimately true thing because the person changes moment to moment. But it's imputed, and then what makes something imputed is that um, uh, it is posited on the basis of things which are not it. So, uh, for example, the color blue is a is a substantial thing. Uh, according to Dharma Kitty's philosophy, which I think we might disagree with now, but the idea is that a, a, a patch of blue is made up of atoms that are blue. So it's just a um, so it's it's sort of, sort of similar to what we're talking about with the Aveshika, that there is a thing that um, is not imputed on on other objects, whereas a person is an imputation on things that are not person. The the body is not a person. The mind is not a person. On the basis of that. We impute person, but nevertheless, the person is a real thing, because we we can say, "I see you, I see you doing these things," and this person is doing that. And conventionally, that's there's nothing wrong with saying that. Um, the reason this is important, again, this all kind of in the end will lead to the Madhyamaka view, is they also reject this idea. In the Madhyamaka view, there is no distinction between imputed and and substantial things. Everything is imputed. So the color blue is no different from the person in terms of being an imputed thing. So actually, just you know, before I move on, so in Dhammakirti's philosophy, the, the person is an imputed phenomenon. The what causes us to cycle in samsara is that we hold what's an imputed thing to be a substantial thing. So we have we have to examine the way the person really exists and see that it's not substantial in the way it appears to us. It appears to us as being something you know, in and of itself that, that we can pinpoint. So next we have the mind-only school, Chittamatra, which is quite a big jump uh, because I think we, sometimes we say that Dharmakirti's philosophy is a like common sense philosophy. It makes a lot of sense in terms of you know, we could say, oh, we all agree, this is real, and then my ideas of things aren't the real, aren't, aren't what's real. But what I'm experiencing, it's common sense. My everyday reality is real. We, you know, if it's not real, then why do we experience the same thing? You know, how can there be, if this flower was a mere reputation of my mind, then I, why would you experience it? But the Chitta Matra and all the all the schools that we will talk about from now on, uh, their main distinction from, we say the lower schools, the lower schools of the Babashika and the Sautantrika, and the higher schools, the Chittamatra and the Madhyamaka, mind only and middle way school, is that for them, um, sense consciousness is mistaken. It does not perceive things the way they are. That we say is the main distinction between the lower schools and the higher schools. Um, so we could say that it's because in their school, mental imprints, are, our imprints of ignorance are so strong that they distort our sense consciousness. We don't see things the way they really are, even with our eyes. Now, as the name suggests, mind only, it, it makes a pretty bold statement that everything we experience is mind. It's not quite that, the same thing, but it's basically, they use the example of a dream. Uh, in my dream, I see horses and elephants, I see castles and trees, whatever they are. We wouldn't quite say that the horse in my dream is my mind, but it's not different from my mind either. Uh, it's merely an object appearing to my mind. And in the mind-only school, the waking consciousness is the same. Waking consciousness is a different level of consciousness, but in terms of the reality of the thing, it, it, um, it's similar. The difference also is that in a dream, it's only it is only uncommon appearance. If I experience a horse in my dream, she doesn't. In the waking consciousness, we both experience a horse. So there's a common appearance, but there's also an uncommon appearance. Actually, if we were to get down to it, as the Chittamatra say, what I'm experiencing is completely different from what she's experiencing. I'm experiencing my horse, she's experiencing her horse. For we could even, we have to, at some level, agree with that. The light that's hitting my eye is different from the light that's hitting her eye. Uh, we're not really experiencing the same thing. We're just uh, coming up with an idea of something that, that is 
um, that we can commonly talk about. But when we when we examine more closely, uh, there's only my 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 uncommon appearance and her uncommon appearance. But they do they do agree that common appearance is a real thing. So again, for them, ultimate truth. It's not that ultimate truth is mind per se. Mind is an ultimate truth, but the physical things are ultimately real, but they're not ultimately different from mind either. Uh, and for them, ultimate truth. Um, so I say, uh, sorry, I should make it, it may be confusing. Things are ultimately real, but they're not, ulti they're not ultimate truth. It's a little bit different. Ultimate truth, what they say, is emptiness. But their understanding of emptiness is different than what you were talking about before with the Madhyamaka. For them, emptiness is the emptiness of duality on subject and object. So the final truth is that the eye consciousness experiencing the white wall and the white wall are not two substantially different things. Um, so might we have this kind of, uh, let's see, pop Buddhism, we say a tree falls in the woods, there's no one's around if anyone did there to hear it. The Tutta Matra, that's, that's kind of a manifestation of their philosophy, that there's no such thing as sound apart from the ear conscience experiencing sound. Um, there, so in, in Dharmakirti's philosophy, which we just talked about, we have the table exists before I look at it. And then when I look at it, it casts its aspect because if the light rays come and hit my eye, that generates the mind experiencing table. In the Chitta Madra philosophy, that's an illusion. Uh, actually, uh, the, the table and the mind experiencing the table are both manifestations of an imprinted consciousness and they manifest at the same time. When I choose to look, then the table manifests in my consciousness. Now it what if you're blind? Then if I'm blind, then the the uh the fact because the um you say the uh, the mental the, the the sense power is not functioning, it prevents the um prevents the imprint from ripening. The right or imprint is unable to ripen in the same way that when I'm sleeping. A uh, non-blind person, when they're sleeping, cannot have their their ordinary sense consciousness is not functioning, so the imprints become dormant and they can't ripen. Did you say more or less table and mind are the result of imperfect consciousness? According to sorry, imprints on consciousness. Imprints. Mm -hmm. So the, the Chittimata talk a lot about imprints. I, I can't get into that now here because that's they have all different kinds of imprints in the mind. They talk about how that functions. Uh, now, again, it might sound, as I said, this is not quite the common sense view. Well, we we can think about how, what does this mean? What is, why would somebody think that? Well, for example, um, well, the color blue. You say, is the color blue, does it exist apart from the mind experiencing it. Now, some people might say, well, of course, the color blue is a particular frequency of light. But what about that frequency of light has to do with the qualitative experience of blue or red, right? So if I, if somebody is colorblind, they can't perceive red, but they can see, perceive blue. Uh, then I, I could say to them, they ask me, what is it like to see red? I say, well, take blue, and just lengthen the wavelengths a bit. Does it have anything to do with the experience of red? So in that sense, red and blue are merely appearances to mind. They can't exist without somebody experiencing them. This is actually what the I mentioned before my, my teacher, Dennett, called qualia. And this is something he, he felt he had to argue very strongly against because this is a problem. Uh, this is what we say, if, if there's mind, is the qualia is the qualitative experience of something. And if materialism does not explain that, that we can explain the material correlates, but what is it like to experience something? So he had, he felt very strongly, he had to explain this away and say, and show how this is an illusion. Whereas the Chitta Mantra is coming from the opposite angle. 
that the qualia is the real thing. That's the only thing that exists. And the idea that there's a physical world uh, that exists independent of our experience of it, that is illusion. So in that sense, they're very similar, but taking the opposite stance. This is why we, when we come to middle way school, they're exactly in the middle of this. And why I will, I'll try to read a little bit actually from Charnta Kirti, one of the main middle way philosophers. I think that his argument against Chittamatra is just as applicable against the materialist view, although it's the opposite extreme. The exact same argument can be applied. But at the same time, it's very helpful to understand their view for a number of reasons. Um, one is it's actually very useful. In the Tibetan system, we say it's very helpful for meditation. It's similar to what I talked about earlier with the Samkhya view, that it it can help us to detach from our, you know, our attachment to our experience. Uh, we can see that how this is a very powerful way of meditating, to see that everything I experience is just a manifestation of my mind. This it's a psychology and not just a philosophical view. Um, and then also, if, if we really can understand what they're saying, it'll be more clear what the Madhyamaka is is arguing against and how they're establishing their own position. Uh, as I say, it's it's not so you know, bogus as it might first appear. Uh, it's it's really worth uh, taking the time. And so, with their philosophy, sort of the, the two main ways of approaching emptiness in their school, one is through talking about the all ground consciousness. So they talk about that there is ordinary consciousness, waking consciousness, which consists of the five senses and ordinary. Uh, a sort of um, is it mental consciousness? Those are six consciousnesses, but there are more consciousnesses. There are different levels. It's it's reasonably similar uh, to the idea of unconscious mind. Uh, there's there's important distinctions, but there's the idea that there's something going on below the surface, uh, and they but they make it this very distinct. There is what's called the all ground consciousness, which is going on beyond all of that. It's some, the all-ground consciousness of the alaya vinyana in, in Sanskrit uh, actually pervades the body. It's something that uh, that comes from, it does not die, so it, it continues from life to life. It comes from past life, comes into the body, and then, per, and then uh, pervades the body. At death, it withdraws into the heart and leaves the body. Um, and all of the consciousnesses other consciousnesses are like waves in the water of the ocean of the alaya vinyana. They're just manifestations of that. And it carries all the imprints. Uh, so a very good example, yeah? Dreams. Dreams, yeah, they're also, the dream itself is a, is a mental consciousness. It's not an alaya vinyana, but it's another manifestation of that. But it's unconscious in the sense Well, I said it, yeah, I did, I, yeah. You're not conscious, mm -hmm. you're asleep. Yeah, I, I wanted to be careful because I don't want to make it too, yeah, you know, this is the, the modern psychology and they talk about unconscious. I don't want to just make clear. It's not quite the same, right? Their, their distinctions and perimeters for what it is are slightly different from modern psychology. If you're interested, there's a book called Modern Psychology and Yogacara Buddhism. Uh, Yogacara Buddhism is, is Chittamatra, the same, uh, by Tao Jiang, J-I-A-N-G. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he he draws out a lot of these distinctions and showing he compares um, Chittamatra, especially the plus because he I think probably is coming from I assume, I don't know but I assume from his name he's of Chinese descent he's coming from in China this school was was quite prominent so he takes the philosophy of um, yeah, I don't forget there's a very famous Chinese philosopher's name starts with an X uh, he, came, he he was a translator also. But anyway, he compares his philosopher philosophy to uh, Freud and Jung, mm -hmm. and the three of them, and showing where they overlap and where there are distinctions. He does a very good job of, of showing some of the, the differences also. Um, but yeah, one so one example um, they would give that I think is very practical. Um, this is a modern, you know person talking about this, they didn't talk about basketball, <laughs> but it was it would be completely applicable to the way they did talk. So if somebody dribbles a basketball, 
we, we talk about this in, in modern sport, we call muscle memory. It's, a, it's a considered, a scientist would say, well, it's just a slang term. There's no memory in the muscle. But it feels that way. It feels like your muscle learns how to do something. Where is that memory stored? Now, again, science scientists would say that this is just slang, but the question is, do they have a better way of describing it? I, I, I think, it, it, maybe I'll talk about this in the afternoon. As I said, I would maybe talk about some of the evidence. Memory is one of the biggest problems for modern science. There is no good paradigm for how memory functions that's universally accepted. Um, the assumption has to be that it's in the brain because otherwise, where would it be? But how exactly it's in the brain is not clear at all. But it they would, most scientists would say that it's, it can't be in the, in the hand. It's not, your muscles aren't storing it. But in the, in the systematic system, it is. Not, it's not the hand itself, but the physical hand. They argue against that the physical, they would argue against it just in the brain also for the same reason that they say physical things cannot store uh, memories. It's still memory. But yes, the, the, the alaya vanyana, it is there in the hand also. The, the part of the alaya vanyana, it's like the, we could say the subtle body is, is and they don't use that word, but it's, it's, a, it's, a simil, it's more similar to what they're saying than, than is simply saying unconscious mind it is there and it's carrying the imprints and those are stored there. And furthermore, that subtle atom level of mind, that, that Elia banana does not die. So when I die and go to the next life, that memory is still there at a very subtle level. So if I was a basketball star in my last life, in this life, I start dribbling. I won't immediately be an expert, but I'll learn it very quickly. It'll just be very natural because my body will just naturally want to move in that way. But for them, it's not just a matter of storing memories. It's also a, a matter of storing karma. And therefore, what I experience externally is also a manifestation of that. Um, so it, whatever I cultivated in my last life will then manifest externally to me in this life. So that, that's, that's one thing that the Alaya Vinata, another thing that uh, I, I imagine most of you haven't heard of, it, if you, even if you study Buddhist philosophy, um, and I don't have a good translation for it, the word Zhenji in Tibetan would mean like the, um, the basis of conceptual apprehension. Uh, which is not so obvious in their philosophy. So uh, I don't know, I don't, again, I don't want to confuse all of you who may, may not have studied Buddhism much, but the, the founder of our school of Buddhism, Sankapa, one of the reasons he became famous uh, is for drawing this out in their philosophy, making it clear that the ancient Indian philosophers, especially Asanda, who was one of the great Chittamatra philosophers, that they had this idea of this thing called a basis of mental of conceptual apprehension that was very that was critical to understanding their philosophy of emptiness. And previous Tibetans had not really noticed this in their philosophy. Um, and he says, if you really want to understand why they say everything is a manifestation of mind, you have to understand about this basis of apprehension. So I think the best way to approach it is when I just talked about Dharmakirti's philosophy and meaning generalities. It's kind of similar to a meaning generality, except that it appears to uh, sense consciousness. So when I see a table, a basis of the apprehension table is also appearing to my eyes. And there, they say there's a reason we can see that, that happen. So I see this table for the first time. Immediately, I think there's a table there. I don't have to go through a conceptual process. Well, it's flat and it's elevated and it holds things. So it's just like the tables I saw before, that's also a table. It's as if there is a table appearing to me before I, I project the table onto it. So in there, they, they consider this, they, the Chavindabhadra considers this to show that what I, the point they made before, our mental inverts are so strong that they, they, they affect our sense consciousness. Uh, it's not just a matter of I see it and then I think table. It actually appears to me already as uh, corresponding to the conception I have of a table. 
And this proves, according to them, that what's appearing to my eyesight is not just coming from external objects. It's coming from imprints in my mind. They take this even further and show it's only coming from imprints in my mind. Uh, that it, although, and they, they say, one of the main imprints we have is to conceive of inner and outer. It appears to me that there is me here and the experience in the external world. And there's this, there's this bar between them. It's a clear delineator. What? Yeah, exactly. It's, he's, they say that that is a manifestation of ways of thinking. Just as it appears to me that there's a table in the same way, it appears to me that it's me here, there's the external world out there. But that is that is not the real way things are. It is just, I, everything is simply a manifestation of my own mind. How does language change this? Um, I mean, if you took a baby, mm -hmm. right, who doesn't know the word table, who has yeah. not, who has not yet learned language, mm -hmm. any, any kind of yeah. language. Um, and I mean, this is kind of far fetched, but you know, the baby is in a cave. Mm -hmm. Nobody's teaching yeah, language. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. So no, nobody is taking the baby mm -hmm. and putting it in front of the table and thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, what is imprinting on that human mind? Well, yeah, that, that, your question is actually perfect because they, 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 they are very clear about that point. They talk about two different kinds of basis apprehension. There is the basis of conceptual apprehension. There's also the basis of name, which is a particular kind of basis of conceptual apprehension, which only exists for people who have language. Mm -hmm. So when I see this, I say a table. Right, but they say when a cow sees its baby calf, it still has an idea. This is my calf. It doesn't have the word, but there is a, an idea that uh, that appears to the mind. That is not mixed with language. For someone who knows language, it's mixed with language. In either case, um, it is uh, it is uh, it is based on past ways of thinking about things. If the cow uh, sees grass in a field doesn't have to think, well, I ate that one yesterday and I felt good, so I'm gonna eat this one. It immediately sees it as food. It doesn't use the word food, but it appears to it. It's not that the grass is food in and of itself. It has to do with the way the cow thinks about things. And also the baby is a very good example because they also use the argument of, of babies. That why is it that the instant an infant is born, it immediately recognizes things. It must be coming from past lives. Um, yeah. I'm sorry again. I'm embarrassed with my mm -hmm. my association, but I'm yeah. thinking about my dog. Yeah. And how she's nesting on a surface where there's nothing. It's like she's pulling stuff. I don't know if you guys you know where animals yeah. can watch the nest and mm -hmm. see. In particular, this particular animal is very obvious. She is like moving stuff right. that I can't see at all. Yeah. She was a bird in her prize. <laughs> 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 Well, you know, the, the, the dog, I'm not sure, but the baby is a better example yes. because, but, well, then it's okay. No, it's it's a very, no, but what you're saying is, is relevant in terms of the projection. But of course we could argue, well, she learned that earlier in life. With babies, we can't argue that, right? That then, so one example I, I do want to give actually, because I think, as I said, with the Chitta Mantra, it's very useful in a lot of ways. Uh, and it uh, there's a lot of phenomena, phenomena in, in the, that have been discovered in science that are, I think, better explained by this philosophy than any other, uh, any materialist view that has come up so far. One of them uh, is actually quite a mystery, 
Why is it when a baby is born and the mother smiles at the baby that the baby smiles back? How does the baby know that 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 showing the teeth it, it indicates happiness or or love? Yeah, that that's a yeah exactly. This is a big study. So the it has to be if if you have an materialist view, that has to be something in the brain. It has to be that somehow programmed in the brain. Or couldn't the baby just be imitating what it sees? You know, well, the the, the, the problem is that the problem is that if if the mother scowls. The baby doesn't scowl back, he cries. He's clearly upset. Whereas when she smiles, he's clearly happy. And if you can measure things in the baby that indicate comfort and pleasure. So can, can you come to the, the, the description? What did you call it? Um, oh, the basis of conception. There, there was Fear. There was the word fear or affirmation. Oh, yeah. Actually, I may have used a different translation. I'm sorry. But yeah, something like the basis of, of conceptual apprehension, maybe I said. Yeah, that's apprehension yeah. Really right. Apprehension in this case, they were to apprehend. Like you say, the police apprehended the criminal. It means to hold something. Right. So the mind apprehends in the sense that the mind grasps onto something. Yeah, yeah. But it's not necessarily negative. Right, no, it's not yeah, meant to be negative. It's meant it's, it's meant that the, the conceptual consciousness apprehends an object, that it holds on to one object and, and then it discriminates that as opposed to holding on to something else. But isn't that the whole start of Samsara? Isn't that the whole start of not being alive, not seeing what's true, you know, that that holding on to uh to apprehend the concept, right? even the conceptualization, is blocking our enlightenment, right? Well, so I think Dharma Kirti, who I mentioned before, the Chitta, the, the Satantrika philosopher, who actually also was a Chittamantra philosopher in some of his works, uh, he had the view, I think I alluded to it before, that although certain conceptions do hold us in samsara, the only way to be free of them is with right conceptions. We can't just let go of all conceptions. Uh, and this is also Sankapa, this is why he, he is considered to have been a follower of Dharma Kirti, even though he wasn't a Satatrika philosopher, is that he took this very seriously. Whereas he uses the sort of the foil, the counterpoint, the, the view of we say the hashang. It's it's a bit um, almost a bit uh, discriminatory, but this is how it is in Tibet. Hashang, it actually hashang, the word hashang means a monk in, in China. Um, and they were Hasha Mahayana was a, a Chinese monk who was in, in 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 Tibet teaching this philosophy that you should let go of all conceptions and just rest your mind in non-conceptual state. Um, and Sankapa is strongly against this view. He says that if you do that, you'll create the cause for further samsara because you don't actually cultivate anything in your mind. Unless you're at a state where you understand emptiness fully, then you should not let go of conceptual consciousness. But isn't it this where you can get proper, you know, in a proper comprehension, a proper, oh man, proper consciousness apprehending the object until you can get to it, mm -hmm. it's all going to be incorrect consciousness or incorrect. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and Dharma Kirti agrees that, it's not, yeah, Dharma Kirti agrees that. Conceptual consciousness is is mistaken, but at the same time, it's a we. I don't think you'd say it quite this way, but it's like a necessary evil. You have to use this. There is no other way because he says, what we want to have is direct perception of reality. The only way to get there is with an inferential understanding, and so Kappa has the exact same opinion that the only way to get to a direct perception of reality is to first have an inferential correct understanding and cultivate that until. So the, the example that he uses, and Sakapa didn't make this up, this is coming from Indian text, uh, is that if I have a hallucination and I keep focusing on it, eventually it will appear to, to my sense consciousness. I mean, uh, the hallucin the, if I have a wrong conception. So uh, for example, if I'm obsessed with a particular woman and I just keep thinking about her until I really lose my mind, you might say, I start hallucinating and I see her with my eyes. This is, this is not a 
good way to use your mind, but it is an ind indicative of a particular quality of mind. Anything that is habituated long enough will eventually become non-conceptual. So on a better, you know, in a better approach is to focus on emptiness conceptually and until it becomes non-conceptual. Mm -hmm. But it is practice. You have to do it through mm. meditation. You have to do the concentrated, um, through concentrated analysis, right? Yeah, but it can also come through discussion and debate. This is why we spent 25 years debating. <laughs> <laughs> eventually, you want to get... Find some magic yeah, here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> eventually, we, we do want to bring it into meditation. Um, but it's a lot easier to do so when uh, you've really understood it very, very clearly. Then it doesn't take much effort to, to understand it non-conceptually. Whereas trying to uh, just think about it with your mind without really discussing it and getting a clear idea of what's being talked about, uh, there can be a lot of resistance or you could go on the wrong path. Live action is quite hard for yeah. me to, you know, when things yeah. are happening, there's so yeah. much yeah, well, that's if you can focus when you're when things are happening, then it'll be very easy to focus when when nothing's happening. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a question about um, um, I I was at a um, a Buddhist retreat. Mm -hmm. um, I I was trained in the Shambhala tradition. Mm -hmm. Okay, Myanmar mm -hmm. specifically, and um, but I think that this is universal throughout Buddhism, and that is experiencing something before concept. Mm -hmm. Before you, so can I walk out and look at the mountains and experience the mountains without or before my mind starts saying? Gosh, that's a really pretty, that's a really beautiful mountain. It's got snow on it, and it must have snowed yesterday, and you know, the story. Um, and it seems to me that if it actually does happen in my mind, it must be so quick and so instantaneous mm -hmm. because I walk out, I my my window, one of my windows faces mountains, and I look at the mountains and I keep thinking. If I, how do I acknowledge that experience without saying mm -hmm. those right mm -hmm. yeah, before you know, labeling, judging? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, is does my mind have the ability to see the mountain without judging and saying it's beautiful mm -hmm. or not beautiful? It has snow on it, which is good. It'll help our snow melt and we have water, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a good point. And I think. The Chittamatra school would generally argue that it it is happening much more quickly than you can notice. Oh, yeah. um, so over the years, as I as I said, I've I've uh, tried to put together. I try to remember when I see things that I think are useful in the context of the Chittamatra philosophy. So different you know findings and evidence. And one thing I is in this context that's useful is a study they did of police officers. It was a study trying to uh, pinpoint the, the seeds of racism in police officers. Mm. And they they were able to show that if they show a police officer a picture, uh, you know, two different men, one is Caucasian, one is an African-American man, before the police officer even is able to identify what race they are, there's an a, there's a reaction of fear in the body when they mm -hmm. see an African-American, even among police officers who are themselves Black. So this is showing that even before there's any conscious awareness of it, there's already some subtle reaction to something. So how do you experience something without, I mean, one of the exercises that we had um, during this retreat was that we were, and, and it, was, uh, it was in Seattle, we were told to go outside yeah. and aimlessly wander. Yeah. You've heard that term, I'm sure. Aimless wandering. And uh, don't plan to go anywhere, just start walking mm -hmm. and see if you have the ability to see something and experience it 
before you label it and judge it. Mm -hmm. And I was a hopeless failure. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like mom just slow down time. I I um I certainly could not detect any instant mm -hmm. that I looked at something and experienced it without judging it. Mm -hmm. You know, the flowers are beautiful, the uh, whatever. Um and so I I really wonder if that's possible. And what does Buddhism say about that? But so one thing that is it requires a lot of concentration. That was probably the main thing that they would, most Buddhist schools would agree on. Is that to recognize that requires very intensive concentration and the ability to, <laughs> like with uh, with impermanence too. They would say that total impermanence is the moment to moment change of things can only be recognized with very powerful concentration. Uh, then it it can be possible. Uh, but that powerful concentration takes a long time to develop. It's not just something that you know, some people are born with it, a little better concentration. It's very different. So it's not going to happen in this lifetime. <laughs> well, if you put effort, it could. But it requires a lot of effort and not a lot of time, too. It's not just a matter of doing it one hour a day. People spend months in retreat without any distraction. If you have to do it quite single-pointedly. Um, one thing I thought another piece of evidence that I found I think is interesting. Um, so I, I, have you ever heard of Paul Ekman? Yeah. Yeah. So he's done a lot of uh, studies in facial recognition and the way that people also what, they, what he calls, um, what's it called? Mic micro expressions. Mm -hmm. So micro expressions is that somebody who, you know, has a particular emotion that they're hiding will show it in their face very subtly. Um, so one example he uses, rather sad example, uh, is a woman who was in a, a mental hospital and was asking to be released, saying, I'm, I'm better now. And they interviewed her and they asked her, you know, are you feeling better? She said, yeah, I'm happy now. I'm, I'm, I don't, I, she was suicidal before, but she said, now I, I, I feel content with my life. I'm, I think I'm ready to be released. And, they, and the psychiatrist decided, yeah, she, I, we think she is ready to go out in the world. And the next day she committed suicide. Um, and they, they had it on camera. So they analyzed the video and they could see that when she said, I'm happy, it was a very brief instant when she looked terrible. She looked very, almost in agony. So if someone, one of them had noticed that, you know, they, it would have been very helpful. They could have stopped her. Uh, so Ekman has done a lot of studies in, and has also trained different people like psychiatrists and police officers to recognize micro expressions. Hey, yeah, well, AI probably probably would be better at it. Yeah. 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 Show her, yeah. you know, resilient pictures yeah. of people who are happy in mm -hmm. different different faces. Yeah. Being happy. Yeah. And people who are yeah. uh, fearful. Yeah. Uh, and or or mm -hmm. uh, in agony. Yeah. 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 And, and maybe Sydney could figure it yeah, out. Yeah, I think yeah. that would be useful. Some point that would be medical research. Yeah. But, but anyway, the point I'm making is that Ekman actually it says this in his, in his book that he studied a lot of people over the years. And for many years, he found that the people who most naturally, before he trained them, were able to recognize micro expressions were psychiatrists and police officers. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was good to train them more until he met his holiness the Dalai Lama, who introduced him to serious meditators. And he discovered that they actually were superior, their ability to recognize this, but most likely because they have very strong concentration, they're not distracted uh, to objects, and they can they can see very clearly moment to moment what's what's appearing on somebody's face or with any kind of object. Mm -hmm. so. um, it's 12, yeah, so maybe, yeah, it's good. Yeah, uh, we'll take a break in one moment because I'll have to come back to the Madhyamaka philosophy in the afternoon, which is fine. Uh, but I just, yeah, just one more thing I want to mention if, if you are interested in this with the Chittamatra philosophy. One of the things I, I find most conducive to seeing, you know, using their philosophy in a practical application has been studied. I think you mentioned language mm -hmm. of the way that uh, certain cultures based on their language experience the world differently. And one of the best examples of this 
uh, has been among uh, uh, Australian Aborigines um, who have very different ways of structuring their experience. One especially is they don't have words for left and right. They have words only self and east and west and so forth. Uh, such that, for example, uh, there was a story of a, an Ab Australian uh, Aboriginal man in Australia who had been attacked by a shark. And he was describing the story that the, the anthropologist examining this talks about this. He observed him over some period of time. And that he was standing there facing east, I suppose, describing when the shark came to attack him from the south. Uh, so he says, and the shark came from the south and he came over to me. Right? And then later he described it to somebody else and he was facing north. And instead of going like this, he was in the car, shark from the south. Mm -hmm. He would always point to the south as opposed to, to his right side. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are other examples like they would, you know, set up objects in a room and, at, you know, ask the, ask the person, then show them an identical room that's reversed. Like there's no windows, they can't see any, they couldn't orient themselves per se, but it's reversed and ask them to uh, uh, arrange the objects in the same way as in the first room. And rather than putting everything on, you know, close to the door, they would put it all on the south side like it was in the other one. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's been a lot. There's been a lot of debate actually in science about what this means. You know, does it mean that we experience the world differently uh, based on language? Which is for the Chittimatra, yes, that would be their answer. That mm -hmm. the way we use language affects the way that it, yeah, it affects our sense consciousness. You know, in Japanese, yeah. there is no one word yeah. for no. Right. It is not yes. Yeah. You say, yeah. and in Chinese, you say for sure. Yeah. Not yes. Right. Which is no. Yeah. <laughs> So I just I wanted to say um, if you're interested in this because I don't have much time to talk about it, but there's a very good book about this called um, Through the Language Glass. Through the Language Glass. Yeah, by Guy G Y U. I say G G U Y Guy, and then Deutscher I think B E U T S H R E <laughs> something. Yeah. Anyway, you you can find that I'm sure. So um, interestingly, while you were talking, yeah. I looked up. I did a search in Amazon for Chittimatra. Oh, okay, yeah. And the two books that came up are in Russian. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, go figure. This is the Russian edition of a book entitled Chittimatra: Myth and Reality. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I never heard of that book. If you want, uh, I'll, uh, that might be good. I I don't know. Uh, well, but uh, I'll, if, you're, if you're interested, if it sounds like you're interested in Chittimatra, I can suggest four books for you, if you like. You're welcome. I mean, sure. I don't want to overwhelm you all, but of course, you, yeah, if you're interested. So one is the one I already mentioned the by Jack John, the yoga, modern philosophy and Buddhist and Yogachara Buddhism, or the other way around, maybe modern Yogachara Buddhism or modern psychology. Okay, so is J, -I J I A N G. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's one. The uh, second one is Living Yogachara. I, and the name is Japanese, and I do not remember. Uh, I apologize, but Living yoga. Yogachara. Because yoga, Yogachara is another name for Chittamatra. Um, that one is excellent. That is a translation of a book by an actual Yogacara master in, in Japan, a kempo of a monastery. And it's C-A-J-R-A. Yoga, so yoga, yeah, and then C-A-R-A, -A, no H. Yeah. Uh, the third one is actually Thich Nhat Hanh, you probably know, oh, yeah. uh, is the book, um, one, uh, no, 50, 50 verses on mind only, I think, is the name of the a quantum, yeah, something like that. 50 verses on a uh, mind only. Because the, the, the hit tradition was also a mind only tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say of the two of them, the, the one by the Japanese one is much more technical, but very clear. Thich Nhat Hanh is much more experiential as his books tend to be, but it really gives an idea of how someone might meditate with his philosophy. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth one, uh, is actually called Ocean of Eloquence. So this is a translation of Tsongkhapa's book on 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 uh, mind only, which is superb. I, I mean, I shouldn't say that because I'm a follower of Tsongkhapa, but Tsongkhapa wrote this when he was 23 years old, one of his first books. Um, and even even when I read that book by the Japanese, 
uh, philosopher, uh, 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 monk actually. And it was the, the English translator at the end of the book, he, he said, uh, if you're interested, because I guess that Tsongkhapa's hadn't been translated yet, but he said, he thinks of all the books he's read in any language, Tsongkhapa's is the best presentation of, of, Ch of Chittamatra, but it has been translated by, by, by uh, Gareth Sparrow, Ocean of Eloquence. But it, it might be a bit hard, it's like, because it's in the Tibetan style of presentation, so if you don't, if you haven't kind of studied that system, it, there might be points where it's difficult, but Sparm does a good a job. He has a lot of footnotes and makes it, tries to make it clear what they're talking about. So uh, yeah, but you might look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's in the back. What's that? It's in the yeah, great. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, we'll have a break now for lunch, I suppose, and we'll come back at what time do you want to start again? Yeah, two is okay. Yeah. So I go for you, those of you on Zoom, also, we'll have a break and then come back at two o'clock mountain time. Christian made some just concurring, so I need to miss. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh. So, Christian made some curry for that shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should I should I end the meeting, Heather? So I just I just said the notion of all comes with oh. the paper bag, which is true, but it's but it's from seven thirty dollars. Oh <laughs> we see we, we have it it's actually published also by an Indian publisher in India. So if you're ever in India, you can get it pretty cheaply. It, it I, well, no, no, it's published in English, but it's but in, in Indian edition by one of the major Indian publishers. I think probably either Motilal or Munchurans, the two Indian publishers. Oh, you know, no, I know who it is. It, it's but it, you know, it might go, it won't get it in in America anyway. It's, it's Sri Sat Guru, the name of the publisher. Okay, should I finish the Zoom meeting? I assume I should end it. Okay. okay. Uh, maybe we'll. You can either pause it or turn it off, Mr. President.